Hello everyone, welcome to the DBS Asian Insights Conference 2020, coming to you virtually. My name is Max and I'm from the Institutional Banking Group at DBS Bank and your host for this segment. COVID-19 has had a profound impact on our lives and businesses around the world. For this segment, we are going to discuss its impact on supply chains, navigating supply chain disruptions, as well as the future state of supply chain. It gives me great pleasure to welcome and introduce members of my panel with me today. On my left is Alex Capri, Visiting Senior Fellow at the NUS Business School. A global trade advisor and supply chain academic, Alex has more than 20 years of world-class business experience in areas including value trade and trade. On his left is Mr. Tian, COO of Toyota's Moto Asia Pacific. Mr. Tian has spent more than 20 years at Toyota Moto, the world's leading automobile manufacturer. And joining us virtually is Dr. William Fang, Group Chairman of Li & Fang Limited. Dr. Fang is a distinguished business leader and a thought leader in supply chain, while millions of consumer goods pass through Li & Fang supply chains every year. A warm welcome, gentlemen. Alex. If I may begin with you, we hear a lot about the impact of COVID-19 on supply chains. Can you tell us what is the current state of the supply chain in Asia? Well, like anywhere else in the world, um, COVID has, has brought a, a surge of different sort of changes uh, in terms of supply, demand. Um, and it's, of course, we, we're seeing that uh, with people staying home and people not going to the office, um, we have a lot of last mile delivery needs, um, but we also have uh, some, some interesting uh, challenges that have come out of, of, of supply chain from suppliers. So, for example, um, dairy farmers, for example, or, you know, from, from the, the, the sourcing side or the upstream side of supply chains um, that have been packaging and, and, and shipping uh, to wholesalers, for example. So if you look at, at the food and beverage industry, um, you know, hotels, universities, big institutions that buy in bulk, um, they aren't open or they've been shut down. And you know, of course, everybody's demanding the same products, uh, but they're at home. At different locations. At different locations. So they're not, you know, a, a consumer at home is not uh, uh, prepared to buy um, a five gallon drum of milk. Um, so just little, little problems like that, you know, solving little things like that, getting the product to people in different locations, in different volumes, um, has become a real challenge. That's just one example. Uh, but throughout Asia, you know, Asia, you know, as, a, uh, as sort of a, a digital first, mobile first kind of um, uh, region where we see in emerging markets a lot of people using smartphones, um, I think we're seeing... Um, you know, we're seeing fairly successful, uh, certainly in places like Singapore, where people are ordering online, um, they're, they're getting things. But yes, of course, there have been disruptions, sea freight, containerization, uh, obviously the airlines have been hammered. Yep. They've got, uh, you know, they're at, at minimal capacity in terms of what they've got uh, utilized. So all of that is, is coming into play. Mm. I see. Dr. Fang. Li and Fang operates one of the most extensive global chains in the world, with presence in more than 40 markets, collaborating with more than 15,000 suppliers to meet the needs of your customers. Can you share with us the impact you saw that COVID had on supply chains? And do you see any change in your customers' thinking when they look at supply chains? Well, you know, um, let me just first say that the way we look at supply chain, global supply chains, is that we actually divide the impact into two parts. One is the impact of COVID on the supply side, and the other one is the impact of COVID on the demand side. In the early stages of this epidemic, this global epidemic, the impact with the concern was on the supply side, specifically China, right? So there was the, the concern was that, you know, China was supplying the world with a lot of product and uh, it was hit and it was locked down. And so there was disruption on the supply side. But that actually rapidly evolved as the virus spread around the world is the impact on the demand side. While on the one hand, on the supply side, not just in China, but in other parts of uh, the, uh, the, the traditional supply places, okay, for uh, manufactured products at least, you know, that means China, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and so on. 
generally speaking, you know, they have gotten, especially China, have gotten their act together very quickly and have recovered quite substantially in terms of their capability to supply. The problem now is actually much more serious because there's now the epidemic is hitting the demand side. And on the demand side, you're talking about hitting consumer demand in America, in Europe, you know, and the, and the, and the, and the uh, traditional consuming countries of the world. And I think that has a much more profound effect because right now with the lockdown, you know, and then the, and then the closed closure of a lot of uh, consumer related uh, outlets and so on around the world, okay, the demand side is now becoming a real problem. So even if the supply side gets back to speed and comes back up to 70, 80% of its original capacity, the demand side is now falling rapidly. And we're still in the middle of this. We don't know how it's gonna play out, but this uncertainty of course is what's really uh, giving serious, serious concern to the whole global supply chains. And that's the problem we're grappling with right now. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Fong. Mr. Tian, Toyota is one of the leading car manufacturers in the world with more than 10 million units produced annually. To support this scale of production, you must have an extensive supply chain network. Can I understand from you, what is the current state of the automobile supply chain? And uh, what is the impact of COVID on uh, automakers' supply chain decisions? Uh, as a background for audience here, the automotive uh, uh, supply chain is quite is a complicated uh, matter. Uh, for example, for each car we have uh, produced, uh, there's uh, at least twenty to 30,000 parts in, in, in that car. And uh, in order to produce that part uh, with a very competitive uh, uh, cost, we need to aggregate it, um, some of those parts and make them a common part so that we can produce them at, uh, at uh, competitive pricing. But because of that reason, we can't really produce all the parts for the car in one country. So that's the that's the uh, the the root issue that we are facing. So uh, typically, uh, supplier will come as a cluster in a region, or even some of them cross uh, the globe as well. So with COVID nineteen coming in here, uh, that creates a couple of problems. Number one is that you introduce the the sudden interruption in the supplier side, whether it's uh, tier one, tier two, or tier three, uh, and we have. Uh, uh, a multiple tier uh, supplier to make a, um, uh, a vehicle. So therefore, and uh, in Toyota, as you also know that we're using just in time uh, supplying system. So when one component stop, the rest of them stop. Yeah. And then uh, even worse is that we uh, try to be very efficient in our pipeline. So we don't have a lot of stock in between. So when something stop, the rest of them will stop very quickly. So that's, that's the challenge that we are facing. Uh, that's just on the supply side, but on the demand side with COVID-19 coming in here like this, the demand for a vehicle also vary depend on the situation of each country. Mm -hmm. So if you're under lockdown, no one will go to the dealership to buy a car. Yeah, exactly. Yes, so that's, that's one issue. However, through this, we also see an opportunity because uh, car sharing or ride sharing situation is, uh, is now slowing down and therefore there is the emerging need for buying car uh, uh, from, uh, from, from OEM. So that, that is a little bit of a, of a, a, a light of hope <laughs> in the whole uh, 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 new era of uh, mobility. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tian. There is much ongoing debate on whether companies, especially those in the technology sector, would diversify or move their production networks and sourcing base in China to other parts of the world, for example, Southeast Asia, um, due to COVID-19 and geopolitics. Alex, you yourself hold the view that um, the US and technology sectors, um, the decoupling is actually inevitable. Could you elaborate on how you see this playing out, especially for supply chains? Well, um, as I've been writing about and, and discussing, um, we're in an era of techno-nationalism. Uh, and that would mean that um, you know, this overarching uh, uh, geopolitical rivalry that we see, of course, between the United States and China means that we're in a, a paradigm shift. Uh, we're, we're tilting now more towards a neo-mercantilist world. Um, technology is at the, at the heart of that. And so we've been seeing the weaponization of supply chains uh, through you know, increase of non-tariff um, barriers or measures, rather, uh, sanctions, export controls, restricted entity lists. 
And this is, this is accelerating strategic decoupling, right? So there are Chinese companies that are de-Americanizing or trying to de-Americanize their supply chains because of the exposure that they have. Of course, Huawei is a, is a classic example of that. We have other Chinese companies, Hike Vision, Dahua, and others um, that, that are implicated as well. So I, I think to a certain degree, um, decoupling, uh, strategic decoupling is inevitable uh, because of the, 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 the sensitivity, the national security issues involved. Um, at the same time, the world has become far more complex uh, because you have decades worth of trade um, that have been built uh, you know, interconnectivity. interconnectivity, you have uh, value chains that are very much uh, China focused. Uh, China will remain and is a very, very important market. So I think in that respect, we're going to see an in China for China uh, sort of strategy evolving with companies where they will, in some cases, have to invest more uh, to ring fence their operations within China, but they will also have to diversify outside of China and, and where it is inevitable, they will have to decouple. I see, I see. Founded in 1906, Li and Fang has grown from the initial startup trading Chinese handicrafts to the West to today where it's an orchestrator of supply chains servicing more than 2,000 clients globally. Dr. Fang, you yourself joined the group in 1972 and have witnessed many shifts in global production networks over the years. In view of the current focus on resiliency, you know, this thing about just-in-time to just-in-case, localization, and geopolitics, do you anticipate major shifts in production platforms going forward? And if so, which countries do you see as being beneficiaries of these shifts? Yeah, you, you know, um I think Max, uh, that that is definitely true. You know, in my forty-something years working, you know, with a uh, creating global supply chains, there's actually been many many evolutions. You know, I think we're now in a what you call a period of disruption because the changes are coming more rapidly than before, and in fact, some of them are quite abrupt and unexpected. That's why we're calling these disruptions. But the reality is that the supply global supply chains have been evolving. You know, the biggest evolution actually was early on, you know, with the creation of WTO, the drop in transportation costs, you know, with China entering the world picture, especially when China joined WTO in 2001. You know, there, there's been many uh, uh, evolutions of the global supply chain. And, you know, and China was, uh, because of its size of its population and because it was primarily engaged in labor intensive types of manufacturing and assembly, there was a big shift into China. That was actually one of the big shifts, I would say, uh, of uh, what I would call global supply chain 1.0. That was a big change, you know, uh, production going into China. What you see now, you know, with the advent of technology, you know, there, there are really three, I think, big trends that are impacting global supply chains now, which qualifies as being called disruption. The first one is the change in technology means that the interaction at the consumer interface in the, in the consuming countries, between the consumers and their channels of distribution of supply chain became totally different. I'm talking about the internet and e-commerce and so on. That has fundamentally changed the, uh, the need of the whole supply chain, the global supply chain to uh, supply that demand, that type of demand, which requires faster reactions, you know, more flexibility and more variety, more innovation, et cetera. So that, that is a big shift and that continues, that continues. Okay, the second one is what you mentioned earlier, the geopolitical change. Okay, that has now changed from a multilateral world, primarily created by the United States, you know, and with, a, with, a, with first the GATT and then the WTO and so on, which uh, gave, gave us a very, very good, you know, global environment for globalization. And that's when global supply chains really flourished. Flourish. But now what's happening is that, you know, because of geopolitical concerns, and Alex referred to, you know, security concerns, Okay, that is now seems to be changing. And even before that, I think we're, we're moving from a multilateral world to a more bilateral world, a more bilateral free trade agreements. Everything's bilateral. And now perhaps, uh, you know, some element of unilateralism on the part of probably the United States in terms of saying that I, you know, I, I want to uh, make sure that I have security, you know, uh, both militarily and uh, maybe in, in, in certain supplies. And, and I'm just not going to be dependent on another power 
you know, a rising power like China. Okay, so, so you have all these things coming in. And, and I think that leads to what I would call supply chain 2.0, where we have to cope with it. But we are coping with it. You know, one, one of the things that, that is very clear to me is that uh, while the overriding concern might be security of some in some, some manner, whether militarily or in healthcare and so on, okay, I think you can still separate, okay, those things that are of security concern to any country and those things that are more mundane. These are the livelihood things. You know, these are like, you know, a pair of shoes is not going to be a security concern. And I don't see the decoupling on that level. The reason why the technology now is, is sort of the focus is because in the old days, you know, the military security and military production is tends to be very different from civilian consumption and civilian, you know, commodity commodities. But now in the technology arena, there are a lot of dual use technologies that could be used both commercially for for day to day living and also for military and other purposes. The lines of blood, right? and, and I think you need to separate that. Once you separate it, then it's very clear that, that you, you have this decoupling effect, you know, in areas of security concern, and you basically go back to a more normal, you know, multilateral world in all the other, I would say, non-strategic, you know, non non uh, uh, areas of, of of products. And I think that that's what I would call the supply chain 2.0, where one part of of, of the production uh, product set uh, that people trade in will have to be uh, restricted because of security concerns by each country on their own. And then you have another part where, you know, we, we, in fact, I would say that other part would become even more globalized, you know, as the, as the, as the, uh, the, 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 the supply chain 1.0 type attributes like price, you know, cost quality, you know, matters more. And I think that will, because of the need for a more robust uh, and resilient supply chains, they need to diversify more. Instead of being single sourced, I think Mr. Tin will have a lot to say about that. You know, remember we talked a little bit earlier about the floods in Thailand and the earthquakes in Japan. Uh, the, the idea of, of single source, even though it might be the most efficient and most cost effective, may not be the most robust, robust or resilient in terms of the supply chain. So I think that world is moving towards actually being even more globalized yeah. than before. So that, that's sort of like our worldview of things now at Lead Fung. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fung. Yeah, so Mr. Tian, Dr. Fung brought up this uh, disruptions caused by natural disasters, for example, mm. earthquakes and right. floods, which Toyota went through in 2011. Would you appreciate if you could share your experience and some of the learning points <coughs> from navigating supply chain disruptions caused by such disasters? Yes, uh, I, I don't know whether lucky or not, but I was there during the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, disaster happened in, uh, in Japan. And uh, there's a lot of learning coming out of the uh, crisis like that. First of all, in the past, we try to group things together for economy scales to lower the cost. So efficiency, uh, uh, lower cost is uh, very important for manufacturing. But through the crisis, we start to realize that, hey, if I have a single source, if this location of the, the factory is, uh, is no longer uh, functional, everything will stop. So that's the thing that we we'll realize. But then we also discover through the handling the crisis is that we have so many suppliers and each supplier have, have so many parts that they manufacture. Just simply knowing where, what they are doing, where they are and who they are, is, a, is a, a very big complicated system. So, so at the time uh, to solve this, we develop a system that to track what, where, and, uh, and who. So who are the supplier uh, we have tier, two, tier one, tier two, tier three, and then uh, what they make and where they make uh, those things. And then we also ask the supplier to really study a very deep, deep understanding of the supplier to them so the supplier uh, of tier two, for example, will need to understand who are the supplier of tier three for them and what they're doing, how they, they're doing, what kind of machinery they're using, what kind of equipment they're using. And in such a case when crisis happened, we know what to do. And now that exactly what we did uh, at the time is that uh, the understanding a certain supplier that can no longer function in the location, we have the uh, a list of equipment and a component, and then we can compare to other supplier where they can take over or at least retool their machinery to produce the same thing. So that's one issue. Uh, number two is that we also, through the Thai flood, we also understand that a unique part is a big no-no. If you have a unique part and it's happened, then the whole thing stops also. 
at the at the time of that high flood, I believe that we have a unique part mm -hmm. coming out from the factory in Thai that stopped the whole Lexus uh, uh, production. So that's another uh, thing that we have to understand that where are we strategically locate those uh, 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 factory mm -hmm. is is very important. And the one I I found that we learned the the, the most is that business continuity plan matter. <laughs> it's a lot of yeah. Corporation have a BCP plan in yeah, place, yeah. and uh, but it's it's paper. It's it's being shelved it's the moment the you develop it. But uh, for manufacturing like us, uh, who have dealt with many crises in the past, uh, it's really matter because you read you really need to know how to execute it mm. to the point when the disaster happened, and you don't know when it happened. Mm. With COVID, it introduced a, a, a different dynamic. It's also introducing the, for example, a much bigger scope and the speed of stoppage, like you don't have a lot of time to react. When the government shut down, you have to follow, right? Yep. So we uh, put a lot of emphasis on making sure the employee is, uh, is safe, the supplier is safe, uh, and the, uh, the customer is safe. But then doing all that, on top of that, how do we recover? I mean, it's a, it's a key issue for us. Uh, and how do you help the supplier, even though there's no damage to their equipment, but they have no cash flow, for example? How do you help them pass through the period where they have no production and be able to survive the moment you want them to open again? Right. Same thing with our dealers also have the same issue. And Toyota, uh, we're lucky. We are a big uh, corporation. We have uh, uh, many uh, support from uh, uh, JAMA, which is the Japan uh, Manufacturing Association around the world. So who will support the supplier to uh, maneuver through this very uh, great period and be able to survive and, and help us. Right. Thank you. Alex, you have been a thought leader for the World Economic Forum on topics including digital transformation. How do you see the Asia supply chain evolving in the coming decade? Well, I think the key word is traceability. Um, and I think that was mentioned. Um, you know, so what, what I call the, 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 the group of T's, right? Mm -hmm. So you need, you need trans, you know, transparency, traceability, truth, trust, technology, and talent, right? Those are the things that you need to have an effective uh, supply chain. And I think um, there are a lot of exogenous uh, factors now that go into needing that transparency. Think of things like uh, climate change. Uh, think of things like export controls, having, uh, having the need to trace exactly where something came from, exactly where it's going. Um, and I, I think, you know, Asia is going to be no different than, than anywhere else in the world where, you know, any kind of state-of-the-art supply chain is going to have to employ those, those T's. Mm -hmm. right. So I think the technology that goes into being able to trace uh, the carbon footprint of, you know, something from its source all the way to the consumer, uh, to be able to trace... Um, labor practices and standards, how something is made, who's involved, uh, and so on. Uh, I think Asia, in many ways, is, is going to lead. If you look at, uh, for example, what's happening in China, in the technology hotbeds there, what's happening here in, in Singapore, in the technology scene, um, I think Asia will, will continue to evolve and in, in, in other ways lead when it comes to supply chain management, supply chain transparency. Dr. Fang, Lian Fang has a vision to create the supply chain of the future to help your customers navigate the digital economy and to make lives better for 1 billion people in the supply chain. Now, may I ask, what does the supply chain of the future look like? And what would you say to companies out there to prepare for this future? Okay, um, first of all, let me just say that I really agree with Alex on that last point. All the uh, matters relating to ESG, you know, the, uh, the ethical and, and environmental and other concerns is definitely something that we, that the supply chains of the future must have. And, and technology is helping us do all the tracing. But we also, also divide up the, uh, the response of the supply chain into two parts. Okay, let, let me just bring you back a little bit. As I said earlier, okay, one of the uh, big uh, trends that, that uh, the, all supply chains of the future have to deal with is the pace of technological change. Now, so far, up till now, I would say in the last uh, 10, 15 years, 
most of that technology have impacted uh, at the consumer interface of the supply chain. Okay, if you look at uh, what what uh, uh, in e-commerce and the internet has done to the demand side and the consumer side, especially, okay, and you look at companies like Alibaba and uh, and uh, Amazon and the market shares they are taking. Okay, all that has been happening, and that whole area has been rapidly digitalized, and therefore it requires, and the demands are are are, are needed on a very very uh, speedy basis. Now, the supply chain that's supplying it, however, most of the supply chain that we deal with, especially you know, which had deals deals with a lot of developing countries, a lot of manual work, and uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of labor intensive type industries. Frankly, that supply chain is basically still analog. Okay, so you have an analog supply chain going into a highly digitalized uh, marketplace, and there's a disconnect. Okay, and the thing that makes it work up to now is a very simple word. It is called inventory. Okay, the supply, the, the old supply chains, the old analog supply chains in all kinds of businesses have been supplying this fast-moving, you know, delivery in seven hours, in 24 hours, and so on, the consumer world, by actually keeping inventory. And that's not sustainable in the long run. Right? That's not sustainable. So what we're doing in terms of supply chain, the future is that we need to digitalize the rest of the uh, upstream supply chain. So it so it's a digitalized supply chain works with digitalized marketplace. That that is the fundamental sort of supply chain of the future concept. Now within that, okay, within that, okay, the use of uh, you know of uh, of uh, robotics, the use of uh, of uh, of um, of uh, uh, sensors and and so on, and and then and. Coupled with you know the the information the speed of information change and then looping back to some kind of a feedback on the demand side and understanding what consumer needs are it's obviously essential. That's what we mean by supply chain of the future. It is actually a loop. It's not a chain. It's a loop. It loops back to what the consumers want and then basically that demand creates then the supply. And um, and uh, and a lot of that has to do with first of all it's very simply the digitization of the processes. Of course, the use of things like blockchains, the use of uh, things like you know AI is going to be all integral part of it. But there's a long way to do the, the whole Internet of Things. But that is coming, and you know that is coming with the technologies that are happening. And and I think uh, and I think that you know we this has really started. You know, as you can see from the picture, I'm too old for this. <laughs> My nephew, you know, Spencer Fung, who's actually in charge of the company now, he's the techie in the in the in the group, and he's actually revolutionizing the way that supply chains work in all kinds of business. And the challenge is really there because a lot of our supply chain is actually in developing parts of the world. Okay, because a lot of the products we handle. Okay, are actually conducive to only being manufactured because of the labor content to, uh, to the developing parts of the world. I mean, it's all very well for people to talk about reshoring and bringing production uh, lines closer to home and and so on. Okay, that has some some uh, some uh, 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 implications. But in general, okay, if you, if a lot of the things that we do, which are which are you know all of day to day daily products, okay, a lot of it you know which, and should. You know, shift to the developing parts of the world where labor is plentiful, and and I think that's what we call uh, uh, our our supply chain, our global supply chain 2.0. You know, where where we basically have a digitalized supply chain on the supply side that could work with a digitalized marketplace. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Doctor Fung.